you and welcome. Um, we have here uh, Amon Benjamin, and he is the wastewater operations manager. Uh, and we're very excited to have him on board. And I'm going to let you go ahead and get started due to time. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to share a city of Austin, Austin water uh, experiences, uh, mistakes we've done and what we learned from them and uh, how we work into um, um, managing our utility to be to do more with less through uh, visual uh, tools through investment, uh, return on investment on CIP. And I'm going to go through multiple areas of the facility of the utility to tell the story. And in our agenda today, we're going to talk about uh, the water, water treatment plants and distribution practices and the advanced metering inst installation, visual management, policy and water conservation efforts overview of wastewater operation practices and CIP visual management, interdepartmental collaboration and wastewater collection system practices, visual management as well. And I'm gonna sum it up with how is that turned into numbers and doing more with less and the opportunity or the conclusion that I really encourage everybody to, to do. So now we're gonna move ahead and talk about water treatment plant and distribution practices. We, uh, we took initiatives to revisit our pump efficiencies all over our uh, uh, water treatment plant. And this is an example on Davis high service pump station. We have an efficiency improvement. We, we were able to get uh, through this project example 10% more flow at the same uh, horsepower uh, usage, which translate into kilowatt hours. So we were able to get more flow with the same with the same kilowatt hours. So visiting pump efficiencies of existing pumps and doing improvements there helped. Uh, that's one way of helping in saving energy. We have three water treatment plants in Austin. Uh, our latest one, oh, I'm sorry. Our latest one is Hancock's water treatment plant. That's brand new plant. As you can see, I highlighted the ESL for it, which is the elevation of the plant. It's 1,025. That gives us five to uh, three to 500 uh, feet of static head without pumping and that reduces our pumping need. And that's a great return on investment as well. And we continue to connect this plant with, with pipeline across to connect the old uh, uh, pressure planes to it. So we can get a benefit of this pressure uh, uh, natural static pressure. And also, we this is a, uh, this is only a 45 MGD that's going to be expandable to 150. So that's one way to save energy. Build your plants at the highest point. I'm sorry. Also, we have pumping a WDCS uh, monitoring center. We monitor that this distribution system and the tank uh, 24 seven operating uh, operation system, uh, operation center. It, it helps us track electrical usage. It helps us to minimize the, uh, the, the filling at the, uh, the uh, filling of the tanks. So minimize pumpage. Uh, why that matters is we have a continuous visual monitoring of plants and water tank levels, allowing for good fill and draw cycles, which is critical to minimize water age and frequent pumpage. Again, another energy. If you can see it, you can maximize your energy saving. The newest addition 
uh, we're working on right now, which is a huge effort for a city our size, the advanced metering installation system. We are uh, uh, we're moving away from flat file transfers and going to AMI network, which is takes the reading from the meter into cellular network to Austin Water and the customer. So we, uh, uh, so we can see if there is any uh, uh, de big delta in, in change in usage. So that alarms us to contact the customer and the customer also have access to it to see it. We also using that system now uh, to, uh, to have pressure points all over the distribution system that we use to calibrate our uh, model. And if there is a variation in the pressure readings and the model that helps us to, to detect leaks in our distribution system and help us focus on where are our leaks so we can reduce our uh, leak index or improve our leak index uh, in, the, in our distribution system. This, this program is it's in infancy but uh, we, we are already implemented, I think, over 50,000 connection, and we serve over a million customer. So uh, the funds are there. The project is in progress in terms of um, building the infrastructure, uh, the uh, human infrastructure as well, to uh, support that uh, system and help us focus where is the leak and where are the worst leaks so we can do um, so we can put prior prioritization on which areas we need to focus on to reduce our leaks and as you can see here it give us instant leak detection at customer point uh, in the monitoring distribution system we have a grid system here uh, that, that conserve water and pumping optimization. Again, great uh, ROI on CIP. Now we're gonna move into policy and water conservation effort through policy. We give incentive uh, for single family, uh, through single family rebates and with our tier usage uh, to encourage uh, conservation. Uh, uh, we, uh, we offer efficiency inspection of commercial irrigation, and we look at commercial car wash, cooling tower, irrigation system, now is limited to once per week. And uh, we, we have uh, customer service support if somebody wants us to look at the irrigation system and uh, we go and offer advice on improvement uh, on the use of water. And also we ask people to connect to our reclaimed water system because our effluent is type two and any, any commercial facility within 250 feet has to connect to our reclaimed water for their uh, irrigation system, not drinking water. And uh, this is a graph that shows we started in 07 where with CBCD of 170. Today, our, um, our goal now, as you can see, we are at 106. Uh, I'm sorry, we are at 119. And uh, we, our goal is to go to 106 and residential to 55. So it has been working. Uh, our conservation effort, we really have made strides in there. That's more than, I would say, 50% uh, reduction. Now I'm going to move to overview of wastewater treatment operation practices and CIP visual management as well. We have three plans. We're one, uh, I think we have, there is only two cities who pump their sludge from their two central wastewater treatment plant into a one central biosolids management facilities. 
so we have Walnut, 75 MGD. We're expanding now to 100 MGD. That should be online by 2028. And uh, we have the South Austin Regional, 75 MGD. And Hornsby Band Biosolids Management. We have two force mains that pump sludge from those two, two facilities to Hornsby. So uh, why that matter is we are centralizing all, all of an, uh, our anaerobic digestion and maximizing gas production. And we are going to, um, we have a, a goal to go to zero flare by 2028 by converting the gas into energy and be self-sufficient uh, in Hornsby. We are today by having, uh, I'm gonna get that to the, uh, in, in one second, the, how we're doing that at Hornsby, but I'm gonna give you example, uh, and a waste to our general plan, uh, how we, uh, by investing in our blower system, we had very old blower system in, in SAR. If I go back to SAR, as you can see, we have three trains in here and we had, um, uh, two separate um, uh, aeration systems with two different equipment to the uh, all, all big sizes didn't give us uh, opportunity to or flexibility in operation to providing just enough air and not burning kilowatt hours for unnecessarily. So we implemented a new project in South Austin region, uh, Regional we made the blowers all the same manufacturer. We have now small blowers like jockeys and large, blow, large blowers, which give us the opportunity to, to, to have a, a flexible operation at, at the plant and uh, don't burn unnecessary energy because now we have a full range of um, operations we can do as we are utilizing the plant. We also got rid of the uh, underground uh, airline and we, uh, we got our airlines, uh, as, as you can see, uh, above ground. So if there is leak, we are, we're aware of it. So we're minimizing air, air leaks and we have ability to detect leak visually and easy to repair. So with, with doing that, actually, this is real data. This is not projection. This happened already. Uh, we have now saved over 750K per year in uh, consumption uh, of this plant while we're achieving the same quality uh, of treatment at SAR. So that was uh, really one great project we did in five years from uh, inception idea to uh, finish construction. We had some innovative purchase. We, we bought the blowers prior to uh, uh, you know, uh, selecting the contractors so we can save time because those take time. But it shows here that we have saved over 750K per year while we're doing the same job and having more flexibility. Now back to Hornsby, like I said, I'm gonna go back to Hornsby. We have a cogen unit that's producing one uh, gigawatt by, uh, from our natural gas. And that is basically uh, making, uh, saving us, um, about a million dollar uh, of cost of kilowatt hour. We produce the electricity and put it back in the grid and we get credit for it just like homes basically. Uh, even though we are the same city, but we're treated uh, just like any customer, exter external customer. And um, we're, Right now, we're looking at uh, other means of using the additional natural gas we have as either uh, make uh, either 
uh, more uh, yeah, natural gas energy to use at the plant. So when Erie comes again with 12 inches of ice and if we lose electricity, Hornsby will have its own electricity. So it will not stop functioning if in case we lose power. So um, we're looking at either uh, using the natural gas in the natural gas network for the city, for the uh, private sector, so they so we get green credit, or we gonna have to use more of this natural gas into uh, into as energy to power the plant, uh, and that's uh, we have an RFQ out right now to see if we can have um, a P three with private sector on the additional gas, but we have a goal of zero flare by twenty twenty eight which is basically, again, saving us on energy. Hornsby, uh, again, we believe in, uh, we're moving in visual management tool. So on the top here, I hope you can see it. We look at our number of pieces of uh, critical pieces of equipment, which ones are on operational, which ones are not. Uh, thick and sludge percentage, the red and green tell us where we are on uh, the quality we want. Uh, HP digester and, and methane, belt press filter solids, and we put what and compost. We are 100% class A compost. We do not landfill, and uh, it's been successful. As you can see at the bottom at the bottom here. Uh, we st we started we were going really high and then we hired a contractor dig over the that uh, the marketing and sales and the overall biosolids and all forms on site is going down and we put weight on every piece the the uh, the the, uh, the the mechanical parts and the quality part and we have here um, a facility score index based uh, based on weights we put on those key performance indicators, and as we go up and down, we we no notate why we're going up, why we're going down. Like you can see right now, we just put centrifuges in instead of the uh, belt thickeners, and it takes a while to uh, perfect that system. So it's impacting our score down to 80 from over a 90. So this, this dashboard is upgraded daily. And right now we are, our operational health is 81%. We were at 90 and we're, it gives the frontline supervisor and superintendent a daily tool to prioritize what PMs, what do I need to do to get that score up based on actual condition and, 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 dyna and dynamic organic data? And to get to organic data, we did uh, a revamp of our CMMS system. We basically consolidated plant areas in grid to determine priorities of CIP based on cost of all kinds of maintenance and energy costs, as well, as well as life cycle costs. So we grouped the plant into areas, you know, we, we didn't just, you know, have assets down to the bolt. No, we looked at the headworks, primary, secondary, et cetera. And we look, we look at the performance of the, these areas and the cost of maintenance, as well as the quality. So for example, this is a, um, a plant, uh, influent uh, pl uh, pump station. The blue line is show, showing us the, the, the capacity, the pumping capacity of the plant, which is of over 200 MGD. I, we call it the AKG for lack of a better <laughs> word. Uh, so when we have pumps off, we have an organic, uh, inside the CMMS system, it automatically calculates lost capacity. 
it shows what work orders were active work orders were doing, whether that is uh, corrective or um, PM or it is breakdown. And breakdown means I'm waiting on parts. So we, why is that important? We, we have the plant, as I, as I said, broke in, into five, six areas. So the superintendent and supervisor, based on the weakest areas of the plant, they can rearrange the PMs and CMMS, the timing, and based on where, what the, where is the plant is, is, uh, is in need of uh, help. So we do not uh, lose, we do not have a, a lot of zigzag in, sorry, in the uh, capacity. Uh, we just, uh, we, we are in the, we just updated our CMMS system. We updated our assets and, and grouped them. And now we're working on how we're gonna make that graph dynamic for, uh, uh, for every facility, for every area. We try to stay no more than six areas in each plant with that snapshot. So we can uh, manage actually our PMs, corrective maintenance and, um, and repair. On top of that, we are moving into predictive maintenance tools. What is that is, you know, we, the, uh, we've learned uh, that there are tools out there that will tell me if the um, equipment is sick uh, prior uh, of failure. For example, uh, we bought something called eye alert, which is, you see it here attached on a pump. And here's my operator. He can see the reports from this eye alert on his phone and see the heat on the bearing, the oil vibration reports. And um, he can, it tells him, hey, you have issue with this bearing or this or that. When we tried this, uh, the, I, I have really top maintenance uh, quality uh, people and division managers. This repair took three, cost $330, it took six hours of labor. If we didn't cut it on time, we probably were gonna have to take, uh, get into a rebuilt mode and maybe $8,000 or more of cost. That's a $2,300 saving in money. But also when the pump is not working at its best uh, condition, Guess what? It's not producing enough flow. It's using more kilowatt hours. So it's also, uh, we're working on now leading indicator, not lagging indicator. So we're trying to predict uh, a problem before it happens because we need to stock on parts. Uh, also, we are investing in a, a predictive maintenance server in our expansions for our anything above 100 horsepower to tell us if we need to change parts in the next next in the next nine months or 12 months so we are ahead of the game we're not losing efficiency as much as we can that's uh, that's a whole new um uh part we're adding to our operate uh, visual uh, management tools that we would like to be ahead of the game, not behind the game. And in wastewater, especially, I don't have time to wait for six months. I have to treat it as it comes. So I have to be really, really ready and working on leading indicators. Lagging indicators usually doesn't help me much. And uh, now I'm gonna go into intra-departmental collaboration. We have uh, an agreement with Austin Energy, our energy company. 
if we reduce using our peak demand, our usage in peak demand, they give us uh, credit. Uh, it's called cartelment of peak demands. And as you can see, the, uh, the Austin water between 2013 and 2018, there is a whole, a whole lot of um, positive uh, curve there in kilowatt, in kilowatt hour. And, and the numbers you see in the bottom, those are the meters that is uh, given us this data. And in 2018, we saved over $113,000, uh, 113, $400 in uh, curtailment saving by trying our best to uh, reduce our power consumption during peak demand to help them. And they give us the incentive there to in, uh, in cost saving. So working with the power company and uh, trying to figure out how you can adjust your plan to make that money back to you uh, saves money. That's uh, one area. And then we have water quality visual operation tools. We use Hawkwim's pilot. So we're improving in visual quality on equipment health. And we have uh, Huck Wims, which is give us uh, analytics. Uh, um, we used to do everything on paper, as you can see here. Now we eliminate that and round sheet and everything is done by tablets in the field. So as you can see here, my operator in the field is entering the data on a tablet and it's automatically on a server, instantly. What does this do for us? It gives us reliability of the data and ease of regulatory reporting. And also it helps us with process troubleshooting and plan upset and root cause determination visually and quickly. And that will, always end up in uh, making sure we are optimizing the use of energy, whether that energy is money or human beings or power as well. So that's implemented now in uh, Walnut Creek and SAR, and it's going to be the dashboard you have seen earlier from Hornsby Bend is going to be in the same uh, format. Uh, in the same software. So we have uh, equipment health and quality health, if you will, uh, available for us to judge our uh, performance. So as you can see, we have a dashboard here for the plant main um, indicators in a, we can just look at it and and that's dynamic organic data, life. We can just optimize performance and see if we, if we can go reduce the air requirements, uh, chemical pumping and usage, and that's all tied into energy saving as well. Now I'm gonna move into wastewater collection system. Uh, I hope I'm not boring you, but that's just the whole story. Uh, the wastewater collection system is, is, is uh, visual management is extremely important because controlling I and I and lift station operations, uh, optimizing lift station operations is, is very critical into, uh, for our consumption. We have 130 lift stations uh, in, uh, in our city and we monitor them on our SCADA system ensure they remain um, uh, at the highest capacity level. And SCADA, as much as it's a big word, uh, creating, um, mining SCADA data was very big challenging for us, big challenge for us. So we had a stopgap measure called Omni uh, site, which is guard dog. It creates reports, innocent reports for us. And this data is reviewed daily by operation. And now it's automated with red and green. 
if a pump is running, usually run two hours and all of a sudden it's running four hours, we can say, well, what's going on there? Send somebody there. Uh, is it clogged? Uh, what's going on? It, 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 so I, I can fix a problem before I lose a pump. It takes four to six months to lose a pump and that's in, that reduces our resiliency. So this data is looked at daily from, from uh, guard dog. We can see it from our cell phones. We can see it from the uh, uh, from our server as, and that's a screenshot of that. And again, that it, 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 it give us on the phone reporting if there's any alarm and uh, overruns to address quick and save energy. We didn't stop there actually, because we have 60 of those 130 lift stations. Uh, before I get there, we also implemented, uh, we bought Camel Max Series 1200 vacuum trucks to have, uh, to increase our wet well cleanings. So that by itself, uh, we do over 500 cleanings a year that reduces clogging and, and overruns and pump failures thus saving energy if the pump is operating uh, at its best uh, efficiency points. We also installed cameras in uh, the CAN stations. So when we get an alarm, we can look on our phone and uh, move uh, control a camera from our phone, look at the lift station, what's happening in the can. So as we are going to the lift station, we can figure out what's happening and have parts as we need. If it's an air relief, air, air release valve is leaking or something, we know what we need as we're going there. So we don't lose the pumps. It saves us a lot of, a lot of time and also it saves us from confined space entry every week. Now we do it quarterly because I can look inside the can um, every day and that's what we do. So it saves us in mileage and trips uh, and carbon footprint, of course. And uh, we can diagnose the alarm as we are going there so we can reduce SSO potential so definitely that helps us with energy saving because we are using leading indicator where on, we are getting the information fast. Now, uh, one other thing we do there is our flow monitoring program. It's huge. We have over a hundred flow monitors all over the city to identify inflow infiltration and diagnose uh, issues with um, that can produce SSOs and uh, reduce the amount of water that we need to pump to the plant and treat at the plant so we can save energy. So we created this back in 2010. Uh, we hired a company, uh, Tillog. We created the, uh, the, the red line you see here, that is a diurnal curve that's given us by system planning. That's what we expect. And we put a band that we def define 10%, 5% as we choose. And if there's so many data points of the, the diurnal curve outside the band, like here we see daily percent drift, you know, 98%, uh, we have a high band, low band and the data. So you can see here like, whoa, there's something wrong here. What, I'm, I'm way outside the range of the band. So that automates a ticket to go to this full monitoring site to see uh, what's going on with the flow meter because you can maintain a flow meter and go and leave and a minute later, a rag comes on, on the uh, sensors and the boom, the, the, you know, all your data is, is off kilter and it's useless. So with this organic 
uh, instant reading, we can get alarms on the 100 flow meters quickly. So we can always get the data uh, uh, correct, the flow meter working correctly. So we can catch ion ion infiltration as fast as possible. And we also have a big smoke testing program to help us as well. Why is that important? Because that saves us in energy in pumping in lift station, pumping at the plant, and uh, keep us in compliance. And as you can see here, it gives us, you know, once those flow meters are working within the bands, which we want them to, uh, to work, we can tell the priorities which basins we need to has the highest peaking factor with rain and where do we need to focus our efforts in repair. So it helps in, pri in prioritization of work and reduce cost of energy and operation and CIP cost at the wastewater treatment plant because the best way to handle our peak is eliminate it from happening or reducing it from happening by addressing inflow. So this is all those efforts that we've been doing all throughout the city. So how does this translate into saving? This data here, basically, I, I uh, gathered from other departments in the city. We have increased 11.4% in customer serve, yet our kilowatt hour increased by 5.4%. We have a 33% decrease in electric, electricity cost at Hornsby Band because uh, uh, of the uh, cogen units and our effort to go to zero uh, flare. So with our effort to go to zero flare with AMI full implementation, CMMS and collection system predictive maintenance full implementation across operation area. I think uh, the 11.4 uh, the and the 5.4, they're gonna be a, even a bigger gap between them in the future. We're gonna have more customer yet less kilowatt hour increase. That's approximately 10 million kilowatt hours saved annually. So we're, we're doing more with less, but the key part is invest, you know, the opportunity, I just, uh, opportunity or what I wanna leave you with is in a nutshell, invest in visual management to have leading indicators, not lagging indicator to increase your resilience and decrease your costs. And with that, I open it for questions. Great presentation. Um, I've learned a lot. And I was wondering, we have a couple of questions I, I'll be asking you, but do you mind going back to your slide with the overall cost savings? Yes, that one. Okay, I just wanted to look at it real quick, but here are a couple of questions that we have. Uh, well, um, one is on, we were discussing the air leaks. Um, can you talk a bit more about that? The question was, when you say air leaks, does that mean leaking methane? So can you talk more about the importance of those piping and with air leaks? How is that a part of the process for water treatment? Oh, okay, the, the air leaks part, uh, can I leave that slide now? Yeah. Okay, the air leaks part meaning for us, meaning the, the blowers, which is usually the biggest consumer of energy at the plant, is pumping more because a lot of what's the air the, is going into the ground. What's the air used for in the water treatment process? Uh, for the wastewater is, uh, wastewater has physical, biological, and chemical. The biological part is um, the, uh, the aeration basin, just one second, let me just tell you where, where they are. You see those, those rectangular things? That's where air is blown for bacteria to eat in the organic matter, to get heavy, so I can settle it 
into the secondary uh, clarifier. So this ear is to give uh, the bugs uh, enough air to breathe to eat the organic matter and get heavy so we can settle it. Okay, thanks for explaining that. And then is it normal for wastewater treatment plants to flare? Uh, the sludge, yes, because to, in, in, in order for us to reduce the, um, the, uh, the sludge uh, volume, we have to put, the, to put it in anaerobic digester where we, we heat it. It's like a big cooking pan where we get VSS out so we can reduce the volume of it. So uh, as part of that process, we're producing methane. And we're, uh, what, what we did, uh, we, we used just to flare the methane, but now we're, uh, we're using the, uh, that, we're, we're cleaning it and we're using it for uh, generating electricity, but we still have more of it, natural gas of it. So right now, either we're gonna go with a P3 of getting that gas into the natural gas pipeline for this private company outside the plant and we get money for it, or increase our uh, uh, usage of natural gas to, to power our plant. Okay. So the, 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 the flaring is, is tied to digestion. And about 99% of facilities in the United States, the digesting facility, the anaerobic digesters are in the plant. Austin decided because of the proximity of the plant and the uh, Hornsby band is like, we'll pump all of our sludge to one facility, which is, it's good to a point, uh, cost effective to a point. Then I had a personal, like I had a question as well, since we're talking about methane and uh, the effort to go zero flare, where did that stem from? Was that from um, policy coming from city council to move that direction or was it just a best management practice across the board and water utility? Uh, well, it came, of course, Austin is very uh, environmentally cautious city. We love our city and we don't want to, you know, put, you know, burn and put carbon dioxide out. So they, uh, that came as a policy and it's like, find a solution. But uh, we also find, uh, through finding a solution, it needs to be affordable because I have to be, affordability is the biggest thing now mm -hmm. all over the country. So I have to, to get those two closer together so find a solution that doesn't impact affordability. Then we had another question on uh, the plans for expanding the purple pipe system. Do you want to talk a little bit about purple pipe? And then it, is there any plans to expand it? Actually, uh, I didn't include that, but we, oh, we have a whole uh, division for that. We... Uh, we are currently using about 4% of our effluent in purple pipe usage, mostly for the um, traditional uh, power uh, generation and golf course usage. Uh, we are um, the, trying to develop um, uh, in our ordinance that any big buildings will have a third plumbing system for purple pipe. So in the central business district in, in, in Austin, where all those big rise building is there, we're trying to, uh, we're building a loop. So um, we're very close to finishing it. So we have uh, redundancy of effluent water. Uh, the challenge is the quality and what's gonna be to be required of the customer at the building point so it doesn't, uh, um, we don't have struvide issues at urinals and stuff like that. When you're talking about the purple pipe with effluent, are you talking about, is this black water that's being used in purple pipe? Can you talk a little bit more about the type of water that's in the purple pipe? It is, 
all, we are required to create a 5521, uh, 5BOD, 5TSS, 2-ammonia, uh, 1 phosphorus uh, water, which is, uh, this is a, a high quality effluent water. This is what we're talking about. And uh, we, I, like I said, we're using 4% of it so far in golf courses and the power plant. But uh, now there is a bigger, bigger initiative coming from the lots of the big tech moving into town and they just want to explore new ideas. Why don't we reuse the water? Uh, we want to be more environmentally sensitive. And we created ordinance now. Now big buildings has to have a third plumbing. Like you have water and wastewater and purple pipe. And when you say big buildings, what does that square footage look like? What do you well, I'm talking about high rise buildings? High rise. So a certain number of stories it triggers yes. that you would have so, to have a third plumbing. Yeah, so so basically uh, using water for flushing for urinal, stuff like that in businesses, and that will help us conserve in our water usage. But it, it has its own challenges because uh, um, really there is no example of it done yet here in the US. Mm. And the challenges we're facing is we have phosphorus in our effluent. And when ammonia and phosphorus meet, they make something called struvite, which is nothing but just like balls of metal. So it's aesthetically not pleasant. And people are like, ew, what's that? So there's going to have to be development in code and TCQ code um, to help us get there. Apple, for example, started their own facilities and they want to reuse all of their own water in their own building. So mm -hmm. that's too old. So they are their, their own entity. So there is a whole new way dynamic of communicating between the city and the regulating agency. Uh, am I regulating him or he's regulated by TCQ? And we're figuring that out as we go. And we can make a presentation about that. It's, uh, it's all <laughs> new stuff for us we're learning <laughs> as we go. Well, since in the realm of we're focusing on energy, but I think it's very interesting. I mean, you guys are doing some great innovative things. Um, yeah, and actually, uh, we, we we can make a presentation about that. And I think uh, uh, Lisa Boatman, our uh, process engineer and regulatory manager, can provide that presentation. Like, okay, here is our journey. Here is where here where we started, and here where we are. So we'll we'll talk more about that offline. Yeah. <laughs> Here's another question. Where is um, the high alert system being leased from? See this again? The high alert system, the software platform that you're utilizing for high alerts and notifications in your system. Um, who are you leasing that from? Who's, who's providing? Uh, okay, uh, as far as uh, uh, operational, uh, the, 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 this is this is M4 for uh, for machines for, for machine for machinery health and uh, O and M uh, and and, men, uh, and preventive maintenance. It's M4 and for the uh, process part, we're using Hawkwims. Okay, wait, wait. So it's it's called M4. And then the other one is? N4, N4. N4, okay. N4. And then Hawkins, okay. And we, uh, as far as- Thank you, I-N-F-O-R, thanks Rob. Yeah. yeah. And as far as uh, predictive maintenance uh, that we talked about in, where did we talk about it? Just one second, I'm gonna get there. I know it's a lot, so many slides, yeah. As and we don't as, have enough time as, for one more time. Yeah, yeah, as, as far as predictive maintenance right now, we're using what we call yesterday bread. Um, it's called I alert, 
which is, it's something you stick on the machine and uh, you have to go with your phone to it. Right now, we have expansion in wild horse plant, uh, one of the packaging plant, we're going from uh, 0.75 to two and a half million. We are implementing um, a maintenance server and we're bidding it with uh, a, a option for Emerson and uh, Rockwell and Honeywell to provide uh, overall system and a maintenance server on site to, to give us machinery health data. But I alert is yesterday bread, it works, but uh, technology, as you know, technology moves fast. So we invited those three to provide us with the solution and cost for anything above 100 uh, horsepower rotating equipment. It tells us if there is an issue, it tells us if parts are needed within X number of months to be replaced. So we know to stock, uh, to be, to be uh, ready for it. We know it's gonna need to be changed. We're, we're not surprised. So we have one last question and hopefully we can answer that in the last minute of our uh, webinar is, is the sludge being used for production of any other energy sources or is it being buried or disposed of entirely? Uh, we, we produce class A sludge and it's used for, uh, co uh, it's a compost. So it's used for agriculture uh, usage or a residential compost. And it's, uh, it's sold at Home Depot today. Great. Well, I want to say thank you again. Um, I've learned so much and thanks for the presentation. Um, we will be, I will be following up with an email with resources, uh, the, a link to the presentation PDF and as well as a survey. And again, if you all want uh, CEUs uh, for this webinar, please uh, fill out the survey. And if you called in, you would need to provide your phone number so we can give you those CEUs to notify. There is one thing I would like to add. Uh, okay. we, we went through it. Those cameras inside the can lift station Mm -hmm. Increases your safety. It makes you ready as if like an EMS going to a hospital with a patient, say, be ready with X, Y, and Z, because you can see it. And it costs less than $400 a site. Okay. That's a great investment. Yeah. Well, um, I hope that you all learned something today. I know that I did. And thanks for joining us. And see you next time. And thanks for your time and sharing your expertise, Ivan. Thank you.